churches used to be the place where black people gathered. So it made a lot of sense that um, organizing would happen in the context of the church. There's less and less people who are um, in faith communities that are attached to churches now. There had to be a point where you knew that this was like your life's work. It's one thing to volunteer and to be join a group or whatever, but what was the point where you felt like this is my life's work? This is not just something for the moment. Mm. Um, well, I, I, I've been doing this work, you're right, since I was 12. Um, I started in the reproductive rights movement and then got really disillusioned with it because I was learning as I went about the racism inside of it. Um, and I would say that for me, up until a certain point, I was doing a lot of service work, right? It was also very transactional. It's like somebody comes to you for something, you give it to them, right? And that's that. That's the extent of the relationship. But there was a summer inter internship that I did called Seoul Summer School. And Seoul stood for the School of Unity and Liberation. And they did a training program for young people of color who wanted to learn how to organize in their communities. So I got accepted into that program and I spent the summer knocking doors in East and West Oakland in a campaign that was an anti-gentrification campaign. That summer, the mayor had announced that they were gonna move 10,000 new residents into downtown Oakland. And we know that none of those people, right? Um, were gonna be people who look like Oakland, right? Oakland for a long time was a majority black city. And it was going to cause a lot of disruptions, and it has, uh, you know, 20 years later. I started to know that I wanted to do this work every day of my life, sitting at kitchen tables, sitting on porches, and really seeing what happens when people transform from somebody should do something about that to I can do something about that. And that for me is the, it's like the heartbeat right? It's addictive. It's like a drug. Like if you can get somebody who feels hopeless to feel hopeful and to know that they also have power and that to realize that power in relationship to other people, it's incredible. And imagine what would happen, right? If millions of people knew that they could be the superheroes in their own story. So I think for me, it was that summer, just seeing those transformations that really made me um, want to do this forever. Yeah, that was a, a part that you discuss, um, just all the, the work that you did and having these conversations. And I was really amazed at how you talked about the listening aspect of it, is that I, I guess maybe so much in our culture, we spend a lot of time debating and arguing and fighting. Yeah. And whenever you were in people's homes, it seems like even if you didn't agree with what they said, that you were really there to listen. Mm -hmm. um, how did you develop that part of it? Is understanding, listening to the community concerns, even as you point out, even if some of what was said were um, sort of uh, contradictory and maybe even about other groups. Like I love that part in the book where you're talking about how you'll sit down with some people, they'd be like, why do Mexicans all right. stay in the same house? <laughs> right. And this and that and going in, you know, conversations going we probably off. are yes. going off, right? Yes. But you were still able to find some common ground and be like, okay, well, let me get you to think about it mm -hmm. this way without it turning into an argument. So I'm wondering where and how you develop that ability to listen without turning everything into an argument or a conflict. Mm. Um, you're right, organizing is so much a science and an art. Um, I actually learned this in a couple of ways. Um, one, I grew up in a household where um, I had to argue a lot for the things that I wanted. So. Um, learning to listen actually was about um, being able to find your leverage points. So there's that on that. I was also trained uh, through this organization and through these um, uh, this, this internship. We did role plays where we literally were listening for the things that could get people to say yes, right? And we would debrief it, right? Well, okay, what did the person say? And you would say things like, oh, well, they said no, but they gave you a reason for it, right? I, I don't have childcare or, you know, I don't know who all gonna be there or whatever. So you're getting to the point where you're better understanding 
what's motivating somebody or also what's driving their fear or their anxiety and addressing it. And I, I think the other part of it, honestly, too, is um, I've been cussed out a lot at doors, you know, um, when I first started door knocking, you know, your impetus is try to get everything out in the first five seconds and people will cuss you out. They'll be like, I don't know what you talk about, but I'm not doing any of that. Okay. And so <laughs> you learn to ask questions um, to draw out the conversation, but it also helps, again, it helps you get to know what somebody's story is and why they do the things that they do what they long for and what they're willing to do in order to um, get a little bit closer to change. Mm. Um, one of the things you note in your book about where there's been a significant shift in movement, which was created in Ferguson, where um, you obviously were and were there for weeks, <laughs> in fact, um, helping uh, after uh, Michael Brown um, was murdered there, is about how there's been such a big shift in in the black movement and where it used to be very church focused mm -hmm. and pastors were considered to be the leaders of the movement. And now that's not the case that, you know, you have you and Latasha Brown and people who do not have this immediate attachment with the church right. itself. That's so right. now that the movement has moved out of the black church, how do you think it's impacted? Mm. Oh, that's so fascinating. Well, <clears throat> you know, look, I, one of my um, new favorite people is Reverend Sharpton. And we- cackle. I love that you say new favorite people because you had, you had some interesting things to say about him in the book. Nothing I, bad though, nothing yeah. bad, nothing bad. I, just you just said what it was. No, yes, you said what it was, yes. Reflections. <laughs> yes. But I, I like him. And the reason I like him is because he's an example of um, what I think needs to happen, which is that we have to expand and we have to adapt and we have to grow. And part of what I think has happened in a lot of ways is that, um, you know, when churches used to be the place where black people gathered. So it made a lot of sense that um, organizing would happen in the context of the church. There's less and less people who are um, in faith communities that are attached to churches now. So, um, and I think there's also been a lot of hurt, right? There's been a lot of hurt because not everybody could participate, right? If it's inside of a, a religious community, there could be, you know, ideas or dynamics around who belongs and who doesn't. Where did queer people go, um, you know, in church-based movements? Um, what roles could women play in church-based movements, right? Um, you know, there's a whole range of folks that would get left out and left behind. And so I think um, this generation's stamp on this movement has been that we are going to be more expansive about who is the we. And I hear Reverend Sharpton talking about that a lot lately, um, talking a lot about fighting homophobia in the church, talking a lot about building alliances with people that you don't agree with on everything, but everybody has a role. And I love that because for me, it marks the possibility of something new. Every time he says that, I think about this moment uh, around the 2014 time when, you know, people were pissed about, you know, Reverend Jackson. Reverend Jackson had gone to Ferguson asking for uh, donations for the church. And people were like, dude, somebody just got killed. Like, what is you talking about? And then, you know, Reverend Sharpton, I think there was a complicated relationship there. And I remember being on an airplane sometime in that year and reading this, um, this article, it was like a profile on the ref. And he was going off about Black Lives Matter. He was so mad. He was like, they don't even have a phone where you can call them. And I remember I was sitting in the chair, cackling in this airplane, like, what? This is why we can't have nice things. But I'm here to tell you and testify that um, we can have nice things. And I think this is an example of, of how that relationship looks. Uh, certainly when you, uh, when you posted that love letter to Black people that resulted and turned into the movement that became Black Lives Matter. I'm sure at that point you didn't imagine that one day this movement would, uh, based off a CNN report I saw, would generate $90 million, okay? Um, I remember when Black Lives Matter was a cuss word, mm -hmm. right? And now you got 
NFL commissioner Roger Goodell, Goodell talking about Black Lives Matter. And I was like, what? I'm sorry. Did, <laughs> the did way I, just, I cackled. The way I, I cackled. I, I, listen, I was you, like, I was like, the way I, wait, hold up. You said what? Oh, oh, it's mm-hmm. cool now. Okay, mm-hmm, I got it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and now I think people look at uh, leaders in the movement, activists, and there is a bit of, I guess, conflict. Like what the point of the movement is to reach as many people as possible. But what happens when there's a celebrity element involved in this? And this is obviously something Al Sharpton went through, Jesse Jackson, they have gone through the same thing. What makes that, that relationship with activism and fame so much more seemingly complicated now? Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's a lot of things. Uh, first and foremost, I think, Um, there's something that happens when a movement starts to become a brand too. And I think this summer was the worst part of it, to be honest. I mean, I couldn't turn on the television without seeing Black Lives Matter, you know, whether it was Netflix, Comcast, you know, Real Housewives of Atlanta, like it was just a lot, right? And, um, you know, so I get it in that way. Um, And I also, don't know how movements become effective if they're not well-resourced. And so that's the question for me. And I think there's also um, a dynamic here, right? Where um, there are so many families throughout this country who have had a loved one stolen from them um, through no fault of their own, right? But by the police or by vigilantes. And after the cases close, after the news cameras go away, they're still dealing with the loss of their loved one and still fighting and waiting and pushing for justice. And it, I can understand a frustration too. Like, well, why is my child's story not the thing that everybody's talking about? We're in the middle of a culture war right now. And aside from the branding piece of it, you know, our opposition invests billions of dollars in getting people to think a certain way, getting people to be afraid of certain things. And it's that cultural investment that actually creates the soil for the terrible laws that they pass that um, restrict our right to live with dignity. And we can't cede that space. So that's something that I think is important for us to take up as well. Now, with all of that being said, I feel very strongly that um, the goal of being a part of a movement is not to be any kind of celebrity. Um, The goal of being in a movement is to move more power into the hands of more people and to use every tool available to us to do that. And I don't think we concede that. Now, some people um, may have nefarious intentions and that's true of every movement, but a lot of people don't have nefarious intentions. Um, And I I think it's important for us to remember that. Um, You know, people like Patrice, who I've known for the better part of 20 years, is a brilliant organizer. Just in the last year, she has led campaigns to shut prisons and won. She has won millions of dollars for mental health care in the in the county of Los Angeles. Um, she is pushing campaigns for sheriff accountability and winning. And at the same time, she has graciously um, taken up the helm of Black Lives Matter uh, grassroots and Black Lives Matter Global Network, Black Lives Matter PAC. There's a million vehicles and $27 million, according to their um, annual report, invested in Black organizations, most of whom are queer and trans led and focused. That's a good thing. And, you know, um, I, I just, I, I want to make sure that as we're holding the tension of these questions, which are important, I would never say shut that conversation down. But I would say um, that it's important to remember who our friends are and who our enemies are. And we are not each other's enemy. Um, And I think that's important for us to keep in mind as we're grappling with some of these questions around celebrity activism or whatever that is. 